Today on How They Do It. JavaScript. Today we'll look at the computer science behind it. So by the end of this video, you should understand what a high-level, single-threaded, garbage-collected, interpreted, or just-in-time compiled, prototype-based, multi-paradigm, dynamic language with a non-blocking event loop concurrency model really means. If you're new here, like and subscribe, because this is part two of the full JavaScript course on Fireship IO. Last week we learned that JavaScript is a programming language based on the ECMA 262 spec. But in order to really understand how it works in a computer system, we need to go to the very bottom of the stack. And by that I mean the bare metal CPU and memory on a machine. This is a real computer, and on here you see the VIN chips that make the computer work. When you run a JavaScript program, whether that be a web application in the browser or something server-side with Node.js, it needs to allocate memory on your RAM to store things for the runtime and for variables and objects that you reference in your code. Then it also needs a thread from your CPU to actually execute the instructions in your code. But here's the thing, as a JavaScript developer, you never really have to think about this stuff because it's a high-level programming language. But what do we really mean when we say high-level? We're talking about the degree of abstraction or simplification that the language provides over the computer's hardware. The lowest level language is machine code. It's a numeric language that can be executed directly by the CPU, but it would be extremely difficult to build a website with it because you would have to memorize a number for every single instruction that you want to run. If we go up one level to assembly, we get some syntactic sugar, but each assembly language is specific to a particular CPU or operating system. So we can move up another level to the C language, which provides a modern syntax and the ability to write cross-platform programs, but the developer still has to be concerned with low-level issues like memory allocation. If we go one more step higher, we reach the level of languages like JavaScript and Python that use abstractions like garbage collectors and dynamic typing to simplify the way developers write their applications. So now that we're at this high level, let's go ahead and unpack a few of the key terms related to JavaScript. Now there are two fundamental ways that we can translate the code written in a programming language to something that the CPU can actually execute. One of them is called an interpreter, and the other is called a compiler. JavaScript is an interpreted language, which means that it needs to have an interpreter in the environment to read the actual source code and execute it. We can demonstrate this by simply going into the browser and running some JavaScript code from the console. Now, notice how the interpreter works. He stays with you all the time, and he translates each of your instructions immediately, one by one. Now, this differs from a compiled language like Java or C, which will statically analyze all of your code in advance and then compile it down to a binary that you can actually run on the machine. He takes your complete list of instructions and, without further ado, translates the whole lot. He then hands them back to you and goes away, leaving you all on your own. JavaScript was never designed to be a compiled language, but in a few minutes we'll see how modern JavaScript engines can use features of a compiler to squeeze out additional performance from the language. Now another thing you might hear is that JavaScript is a dynamically typed language, which tends to be a common characteristic with high-level interpreted languages. And that just means that we don't use any explicit type definitions in vanilla JavaScript code. We can look at this by comparing some statically typed Dart code to some dynamically typed JavaScript. In the Dart code, you'll notice that we're annotating things like integers and strings but the JS types are unknown or implicit. And that's because the type is associated with a runtime value and not the actual variables or functions in your code. Now, you might also hear that JavaScript is a multi-paradigm language. The vast majority of general purpose programming languages are multi-paradigm, allowing you to combine styles from declarative functional approaches or imperative object-oriented approaches. Now, one of the weirder things that you'll hear is that JavaScript is based on prototypal inheritance. This course will have an entire video dedicated just to this topic, but the general idea is that everything in JavaScript is an object, and each object holds a link to its prototype. And this creates a prototype chain where objects can inherit behaviors from other objects. This can be a weird thing to get used to if you're familiar with class-based inheritance, but it's one of the low-level concepts that makes JavaScript a very flexible, multi-paradigm language. Now, let's take a second to recap. We know that JavaScript is a high-level, interpreted, dynamically-type, multi-paradigm, prototype-based language, but it's also a single-threaded, garbage-collected, non-blocking language with an event loop that can be just-in-time compiled. The first set of definitions are mostly related to how JavaScript is laid out in ECMA 262, but it doesn't specify how the interpreter should be implemented, how to manage memory, and it doesn't even mention the event loop in the entire 800-page document. So that means it's up to the browser vendors to handle these implementation details, and two of the most popular implementations are SpiderMonkey from Mozilla and V8 from Google. The way they work is slightly different, but they both do a thing called just-in-time compilation. In the case of V8, it will compile all of your JavaScript down to native machine code before running it, as opposed to interpreting bytecode line by line like a normal interpreter. To anyone out there who wants to go fast, anybody, 
I want to go fast. So these JavaScript engines don't fundamentally change the way developers write their code, but the JIT compiler helps improve performance in browsers and on Node. But here's the thing, JavaScript is a single-threaded language, so it can only do one computation at a time. What I want you to do right now in this browser tab is open up the console with Control shift j and then create a while loop that never ends. You'll notice that nothing works in this browser tab now. If you try to click on something, it will never capture that event, because the single thread is stuck in that while loop and it can't move on to the next event. Go into the Chrome Task Manager, and you should see that browser tab using close to 100% of that CPU core's resources. Go ahead and end the process, refresh the tab, and then meet me back here to learn more about why that happened. When executing your JavaScript code, two regions of memory are allocated on the machine, the call stack and the heap. The call stack is designed to be a high-performance, continuous region of memory used to execute your functions. When you call a function, it creates a frame in the call stack that contains a copy of its local variables. If you call a function within a function, it will add another frame to the stack, but if you return from a function, it will pop that frame off the stack. I think the best way to understand the call stack is to go through some of your own code frame by frame. You can go into the Sources tab in Chrome DevTools and pause the execution of a script, and then you can follow the call stack step by step. If you look down here at the bottom, you can see we're calling this function called current status. When we call that function, it then moves us up to the function body that first starts with a console log. A console log is a one and done operation, so it gets pushed onto the stack and then executed and immediately popped off the stack. But then if we go to the next line, you can see it returns a function that also calls a function for its argument. So the next step is to call that happy function for the argument, and then you can see it gets pushed onto the call stack here. And this happy function has its own local variable named foo, which we can see on the local scope for this frame in the call stack. And another nice thing is that you can see the this context for the function, which in this case is the window. So the call stack will push as many frames as it needs and then start popping them off as they're executed on the machine. But what happens if we have a situation where the call stack never reaches a return statement, for example, a recursive function? In the stack overflow function, we're incrementing a count for every frame in the call stack. Now, eventually Chrome will throw a call stack size exceeded error, but an interesting thing to note here is that each frame in the call stack will contain a copy of the local count, which we can inspect by traversing through the call stack. But what happens when we run into something a little more complex, like an object that might be referenced by multiple function calls outside of this local context? That's when the heap comes into play. It's a mostly unstructured memory pool where we store things like objects or primitive values inside of closures. In this code example, we have an object called myCounter, and then we're incrementing it with a function call. From there, we'll go over to the memory tab in Chrome and take a heap snapshot. And then we can search for that variable by name and see it in the heap. The special thing about the heap is that it's garbage collected. That means that V8 or the JS runtime will try to clear up free memory when it's no longer referenced in your code. That doesn't mean you don't need to worry about memory, but it just means that you don't need to manually allocate and free up memory like you would in a C language. So now that you know what the call stack and the heap are all about, we can introduce the event loop. Now we already saw how a simple while loop can entirely break a single threaded language. So that leads to the question of how do we handle any kind of long running task? The answer is the event loop, so let's go ahead and write our own from scratch. In the most basic sense, it's just a while loop that waits for messages from a queue, then processes their synchronous instructions to completion. In the browser, you're already doing this all the time without even thinking about it. You might set up an event listener for a button click. When the user clicks that button, it sends a message to the queue, and then the runtime will process whatever JavaScript you defined as the callback for that event. And that's what makes JavaScript non-blocking, because the only thing it ever does is listen to events and handle callbacks, so it's never actually waiting for the return value of a function. The only thing it's actually waiting for is the CPU to process your synchronous code. And for most things, that's on a scale of microseconds. Now let's imagine the first iteration of the event loop. It will first handle all of the synchronous code in the script. After it's done running the synchronous code, it checks if there are any messages or callbacks in the queue ready to be executed. We can demonstrate this behavior very simply by adding a set timeout to the top of the script for zero seconds. Now you might intuitively think that this timeout should be executed first because it's at the top of the file and it's a timeout for zero seconds, but the event loop won't actually get to it till it's done running this first iteration of synchronous code. Now what makes this so special is that you can offload long running jobs to completely separate thread pools. In the browser, you might make an HTTP call that takes a few seconds to resolve, or on Node.js, you might need to interact with the file system, but you can do these things without blocking the main JavaScript thread. And that's almost everything you need to know about the event loop, but JavaScript had to go and make things a little more weird with the introduction of promises and the micro task queue. If we go back to our script and add a promise resolve after the set timeout, 
you would think that we have two asynchronous operations here with zero delay, so the set timeout would fire first and then the promise second. But there's actually this thing called the micro task queue for promises, which has priority over the main task queue used for DOM APIs and set timeouts and things like that. That means the handler for the promise will be called back first in this case. As the event loop goes through an iteration, it will first handle the synchronous code, then it's going to go to the micro task queue and handle any of the callbacks that are ready from your promises. And lastly, it will finish up by running the callbacks that are ready from your set timeouts or DOM APIs. And that's how JavaScript works, I guess. If all this sounded overwhelming to you, don't worry too much because you don't really need to know any of it to start building stuff with JavaScript. In the upcoming videos in this series, we'll look at the practical applications of JavaScript as they relate to building real products. So make sure to subscribe and follow along with the source code on Fireship.io. Thanks for watching, and I will talk to you soon.